All right, as I just mentioned, you know, we're doing our challenges every month. So we're coming up on April. Tomorrow is April 1st. So we're starting a brand new challenge for our month. And this month, coming up in April, we're going to be focusing on getting people baptized. And this, um, this is lining up, of course, with what I preached last week. Last week, I preached on following up with new believers. So when you get somebody saved, just kind of how we should go about um, just trying to contact them again, try to keep in touch with them, do it by phone. It's easy to make a call. You know, we don't want to harass people, but we want to try to, you know, encourage them a little bit and see, see if we could get them to, to start being discipled, come to church, get baptized. And what I want to do as a church is to be able to focus on this for this whole month and, and get the, the pattern developed and get the habits instilled that we understand that this is an important part of, of going out and even just giving the gospel is bringing up baptism to people and just explaining it to them, expressing it to them. And I'm going to preach an entire sermon this morning just about baptism to help you, if you don't already know, how to be able to explain baptism to someone else and explain why it's important, explain what it is, explain what it isn't. You know, you don't have to go into all of this detail with someone at the door necessarily, but I think one of the reasons why people might not get baptized is that they don't really understand it. They don't really know anything about it. And they might just be a little bit fearful just because of the unknown, because they don't know what you're going to do. They don't know what it entails. So we want to be able to explain to people so that they could just be a little bit more comfortable about it and say, oh, yeah, sure, I'll do that. And we're going to get into all the things. You know, it's a commandment. There's a lot of things that the Bible teaches about baptism. Uh, and we'll get into all that in just a minute here. But for our church, what I want to do is to have three baptisms this month. I think it's a fair goal. And um, if we can accomplish that, this is going to be a little bit different because what I'm going to do is I'll plan a church-wide event. There's a church effort. It's a group effort here trying to get people baptized. It could be more than one person involved getting one person baptized, you know, talking to people. So this is a church Thing. If we could meet this goal as a church, then we'll, I'm going to schedule something fun for everybody to do. We'll go out and we'll have a good time. And then those people who were directly involved with, you know, getting someone baptized, we'll, we'll get a double portion or, or a special whatever in, in the event that we do. So uh, that's what I'd like to do for our challenge this month. But I really want to focus on that becoming a normal part of something that you bring up with people or if you run into someone at the door who's already saved. Amen. You know, you, you talk to them because we're out soul winning. You want to know, hey, do you know for sure if you die today you go to heaven? Yes, I'm saved. I believe in Jesus Christ. It's eternal. I can't lose it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, how about this, brother? Have you ever been baptized after you believed? It's a fair question. doesn't take up a whole lot of your time. It's a yes or no answer. There's, there's no middle ground or debate for that. Either, either you did or you didn't, right? And if they did, great. If they didn't, well, hey, why don't you come on out and get baptized then? And, and we'll get that taken care of. You know, I'm, I'm an example of someone who got saved when I was 20 years old, but I didn't get baptized for like another six or seven years later. So I would have been a great candidate if someone knocked on my door when I was 21, 22, 23, 24, 20, you know, I knew I should have got, I knew for a long time I should be baptized. I didn't do it. But if someone showed up, you know what? Yeah, you're right. They're inviting me to church. I haven't been to their church. I haven't been to any church, you know, great opportunity. So uh, that is the focus for this month. So let's get into the teaching and the sermon. The first thing I want to point out, we'll get to 1 Corinthians 1 in a minute, is that obviously we believe here and we know for a fact that baptism is not a requirement for salvation. And this is an important place to start because there's a lot of false teaching out there. Um, people who believe literally that you have to be baptized in order to be saved, that believing, it's not just believing, it's believing and being baptized. And one of the scriptures they'll turn to to prove this is in Mark chapter 16. It's the last couple of verses in the book of Mark. If you want to keep your place in 1 Corinthians 1, you can take a look at this. And the reason why I'm bringing this up and pointing this out is that oftentimes, and it's been my experience when I'm talking to people out soul winning, and they believe that you have to be baptized to be saved, 
The only reason they believe that is because they've been told that. Now, they've been taught that, but they usually can't tell you in Scripture where it says you need to be baptized to be saved. But here's the thing. Even though you can't get them to say, well, why don't you show me where it says that? Well, I don't know. What, but I know it says it in there somewhere. I like turning to the verses that they'll use because there's only a couple of them anyways that they could possibly go to to try to teach this doctrine. I like just going there and just showing them and explaining to them just flat out, look, this is wrong. If they can't show me where it is in the Bible, I, will, I say, I will show you. I say, this is where they're getting the teaching from. Let me show that to you. Because oftentimes when people are just stuck on that, they've been taught that a certain way, it's going to be hard for them to let that go. Especially when... Well, I don't know where it is, but I just know that you have to be baptized to be saved. So it's good to just educate them and show them where it is. So Mark chapter 16 is one of those places. Verse number 15, the Bible says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's a great commission. This is a great verse. Uh, preached oftentimes. And then the next verse, verse 16 says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. So you say, well, see right there, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, right? So you have to believe and be baptized to be saved. Well, that's not what it says. It doesn't say you have to believe and be baptized to be saved. It's not what it says. That's, that is an interpretation. It's making a statement. First of all, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, I believe and I'm baptized. So will I be saved? Yes. Am I going to be saved from going to hell? Yeah. Yes. If you've been saved, if you believe and you've been baptized, so it's a true statement. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And notice, I, I love to contrast this with what Acts 16, verses 30 and 31 says, where a man says, what must I do to be saved? If anything other than believing is a requirement for you to be saved, then the answer that they give him and what must must I do to be saved? If it's not listed there, then it's not a requirement. Or they're lying to him, and I doubt that God is going to have verses like that in the Bible where they're flat out lying to somebody under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost just to confuse us. Not going to happen. Because when he said, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And people might try to argue and say, yeah, but he ended up getting baptized. See, so they still taught him. Yeah, he got baptized because he should have gotten baptized. But it wasn't for his salvation. They specifically told him with, his, with their words what he had to do to be saved. So just because he got baptized doesn't mean that he had to in order to receive salvation. They told him what he had to do to be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And even in this verse in Mark chapter 16, verse number 16, the verse continues. It says, but he that believeth not shall be damned. It doesn't say, but he that believeth not and is not baptized. Right. Or it doesn't say, but he that believeth and is not baptized shall be damned. Right. It doesn't say that. Exactly. It only brings up the belief part. Why? Because it's the belief that either damns you or saves you. You don't believe, you're damned. You do believe, you're saved. It's that simple. And I just like pointing this out. It's, it's not a difficult, you know, for people who have been taught a certain way, they only look at a verse in a certain light. They'll look at a verse like this and say, well, I mean, I can't argue with that. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved because they've been taught it for so long. That's why I like to turn to these verses because there's not very many of them, especially. I mean, it doesn't take that much time out of your gospel presentation. It's an important point to cover if they're believing in some work that needs to be done to be saved. The Bible says in John chapter 4, verse number 1, and you, you don't have to turn there, just stay in 1 Corinthians. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll show, show you this in just a minute. Because 1 Corinthians 1 is the other place I turn to people to show them that baptism is not a requirement for salvation. John chapter 4, verse number 1, the Bible reads, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, now, if Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost, if Jesus' whole goal was to get people saved, that the world through him might be saved, wouldn't you think he'd be out baptizing people, like even just personally, Jesus baptizing people, if that was a requirement for salvation? 
He didn't do it. His disciples baptized people. Jesus had his disciples baptize people, but Jesus himself did not baptize anyone. Now, that's as, not as strong of an argument here as like just demonstrating what Mark chapter 16 is talking about. So I don't, always, I don't turn to that, but it's just another, another example, another proof. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we have another one, another example like that. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 14, the Bible says, I thank God that I baptized none of you. I thank God that I baptized none of you. Well, if baptism was required for salvation, what in the world is Apostle Paul talking about? Right. Thank God I didn't baptize you. Right. <laughs> well, hold on a second there, Paul. I wouldn't say, thank God I didn't preach the gospel to you. We don't see that anywhere in Scripture. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Amen. Amen. Now, does that make baptism a bad thing? No, of course not. It's a great thing. And it's something that people should be doing. And Paul baptized people. But he said, my job is to preach the gospel. That's why God sent me. That's what I need to do. Above all things, I need to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and get people saved. Because it's not through baptism at all. Turn to Acts chapter 2. This is, this is the only other place. Um, because I like to ask that question for people who are just adamant. No, no, you have to be baptized to be saved. Then why did the Apostle Paul... Why was he not sent to baptize? I mean, he was an evangelist. His job was getting people saved. Of, of people that we read about in Scripture, it's hard to find someone who did more soul winning and leading more people to Christ than the Apostle Paul, at least what we have written down. I mean, he did a lot. Look at all the churches that were started as a result of Apostle Paul's ministry. And he says, I wasn't sent to baptize it's a pretty weak argument to say then that baptism is required for salvation. Yeah, right. What would be the point of the Apostle Paul? And see, this covers the different dispensations too. If someone believes, oh, well, the baptism wasn't required until after Jesus rose again from the dead. Well, this is after Jesus rose again from the dead. Well, it was required when Jesus and John the Baptist were doing it. Well, Jesus said, the Bible said that Jesus didn't baptize yep. when he was, you know, so <laughs> there, there's no wiggle room. To, to even try to say, oh, just from this time to this time or whatever, that, that it was a requirement then. Acts chapter 2 is the other place that I personally like to turn to if, uh, if I think I could get through, you know, with, with he that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. If someone's just going to be stuck on, on baptism, I usually will just show a Mark 16 and Acts chapter 2 because those are the two verses that they're going to be have drilled into their head anyways as far as why a person needs to be baptized to be saved. And if they can't get it from there, then I'll just move on. But Acts chapter 2, we're going to look at verse number 36. Because Acts chapter 2 actually tells us why we need to be baptized. Acts chapter 2, verse 36, the Bible says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now again, I love contrasting Acts 2 with Acts 16. First of all, just what must I do to be saved is extremely clear versus what should we do? So ask me, what should I do? You should get saved. You should get baptized. You should get sin out of your life. You should go to church. You should live for God. You, we could keep going on and on. What should I do? Here's what you should do. The question does not ask what, is, what I have to do to be saved and go to heaven. Not, that's not what it asks. What shall we do? But then here's their answer. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, this is another 
twisting or misinterpretation or understanding of what the Bible is saying here in the English language. So again, when people get used to hearing things taught a certain way, it's hard to take a step back and look at it in a new light, just, just with, fresh, with a fresh set of eyes. This is, uh, I always like to liken this with people who teach Calvinism, right? There's certain ways that they read the verses that they'll, they'll try to tell you, see, this shows that, that God chose who's going to be saved and who isn't going to be saved. And they get you stuck in that mindset so that you start to read the scripture in that light yeah. as opposed to just what is it actually saying here? What is the meaning and does it line up with the rest of scripture? When it says here, be baptized everyone in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. For the remission of sins doesn't mean in order for your sins to be remitted, you need to be baptized. That's the way that they read that verse. In order for you to be saved, in order for those sins to be paid for, to be remitted, you need to be baptized. That might be a more common usage of the word for today, but not even completely. Because for doesn't always mean in, in order to. And the, the best example that everybody is probably familiar with would be like wanted for murder. It's just, it's just a really good example of the use of the word for in the context and how it's being used here. Wanted for murder doesn't mean you're putting up an ad and saying, I'm looking for somebody in order to do a murder. That's not what anybody that would look. If you saw a sign and a picture and it said wanted for murder and it's got this mug shot, no one's going to be thinking, hey, the Department of Justice is looking for somebody to, to be a hitman and to murder someone. Or the FBI's most wanted list, right? That's not what they're looking for. For murder means because of. Because that's what they did. They're wanted because of murder. So why does the person get baptized? Because they're saved, because their sins have been remitted. So it says here that, and be baptized everyone in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. That's why we were baptized, because we've been saved, because our sins are remitted. That's why you get baptized. And that's what this verse is saying. So when it says repent, it doesn't say repent of your sins, it just says repent. And I believe this is talking about them being saved, repent. Change what you believe. Put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent and then be baptized for the remission of sins. Be baptized because you've been saved. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So very clear. That's a, and, and you know what? When you view the Bible from that understanding, it matches up with every other scripture that you can turn to about salvation being by grace through faith and has nothing to do with baptism. And you could, there's a lack of any mention of baptism in all of the other verses that are talking about eternal life. They're talking about everlasting life. They're talking about salvation. They don't even mention it. These are the only two places, essentially, you may be able to use a third, but that are talk that even bring up baptism at all in some context regarding salvation. So I like to show that to people. It's an important distinction to make that, that before we go any further with baptism, you have to understand it's not about salvation. Well, it's about salvation. It's not about you being saved or getting saved. It's about, it's about you already having been saved. Now, when should we get baptized? Turn to, actually, you could stay in the book of Acts. Turn to Acts chapter 16, and I'm going to read for you from 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 gives us a picture of baptism from the Old Testament. It's a pretty cool passage. I'll just read this for you. 1 Corinthians 10 verse number 1, the Bible says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Which, first of all, this is a great passage to show that people in the Old Testament were saved by putting their faith in Jesus Christ, even though they didn't know the name of Jesus Christ. 
Because this is talking all about the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. They're saying they ate and drank of that rock, that spiritual rock, which was Christ. And it's also bringing a, a symbolic reference to them being led out of Egypt. So as soon as they're delivered, they're delivered from the bondage. They're saved from Egypt. They're brought out. As soon as that happens, that's when Moses parts the Red Sea, right? They've got the cloud as they're covering, keeping them already away from the Egyptians. So as they're leaving and the Egyptians are following them, trying to kill them, whatever, God's already protecting them. He's got the, the pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day. And of course, a cloud's going to be enveloping them. They're going to be immersed in the cloud. They go through the Red Sea. They've got water up all around them, essentially. The water's come up on both sides. They're walking through on dry land. That's a representation or a picture of baptism. And that happens right after they're delivered. I mean, as soon as they are out of Egypt, they're getting baptized, spiritually speaking. But there's much more clear verses about this, and we'll see this in the book of Acts. Uh, look at Acts 16, verse number 30. I was just referring to these verses and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. So he asked, Hey, how do I get saved? Here's a guy that doesn't know how to be saved and he wants to be saved. And they tell him, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. So they preach him the gospel. They preach his whole household the gospel. They believe... And look what happens in verse number 33. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his, straight way. Right away. They baptized him. Right away. There was no hesitation. There was no waiting. And the reason why I bring this up is because there's churches out there, churches who even believe the right gospel, who preach the right gospel, who will tell you to wait. Who tell you, no, 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 wait, we need to explain this to you. We want to make sure that you're sure about this. We want to make sure that you're making, you know, whatever reasoning they give, you've got to take a class. You've got to come here for weeks. We need to check you and do a fruit inspection, make sure you're saved before we're going to do a baptism on you. But you know what? That is not found anywhere in Scripture, not even one time. There is never a hesitation to baptize people that put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They're never saying, well, I don't know, you're a jailer. Are you going to quit being a jailer now? Are you going to quit throwing God's people in prison? Huh? In fact, he brings them back to prison. <laughs> he takes them out of prison in this story. He washes their stripes. He kind of takes care of them a little bit. But you know what happens? He gets saved. His household gets baptized. Then he brings them back to prison. He didn't even let him go. Oh, we well, must not have been saved and I can't believe. See, this is why we need to have him wait a while before you baptize him. No. Turn to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. We see another example of this. And we also, what's taught very clearly in Acts chapter 8 is that you believe first Baptism second. That is the right order of baptism. It's not baptized as a baby and then you believe and it's all good. It's not baptism in some false religion before you understood salvation, before you actually got saved. And then, well, I got baptized there and I got saved now and I'm good. That's not the way it works. Look at Acts chapter 8, verse number 12. The Bible says, But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also, and he was baptized. He continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. So we're seeing right here, people believe, they get baptized. And it's happening right away. Jump down to verse number 35. This is the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Excellent place to turn. I oh, when I want to show someone being baptized, I always turn to this passage. I always turn to this passage with someone who's a new believer because I could actually kill two birds with one stone with this one passage right here. Explain the importance of the King James Bible as well as the importance of being baptized. 
Acts chapter 8, verse number 35, the Bible reads, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? So he's hearing the gospel of Christ. He's hearing what Philip has to say. They're riding along in the chariot. And as they're riding, there's this water over there. Now, we don't get a lot of this today. This was a big deal because, you know, the baptism thing was new. John the Baptist started baptizing people. It got a lot of attention. People being baptized. It's something that stuck out. It's something that stood out to people. It's something that was being done publicly. People being baptized, being baptized in rivers. You see other people doing it. You don't, maybe this, this guy probably didn't understand what it's all about, but he, he knew enough that when, you know, that these are followers of Christ and they're getting baptized. So he's hearing the gospel. They're riding in a chariot and he's like, hey, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? And the reason why I even asked that question is because now he's believing. He's got his faith in Jesus Christ. So now he's thinking, well, hey, I want to, I want to get baptized too. But he asks the question, why can't I be baptized? And Philip answers him, verse number 37, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Amen. And look what happens next. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. The guy just got saved. I, he just got saved, and Philip said, the only thing, the only thing that's going to prevent you from getting baptized is whether or not you believe in Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you believe with all your heart? Is it completely on Christ? You're not trusting anything in yourself. It's only Christ. Are you really saved? You believe that? Get baptized. And he does it right there. They stop. Right, let's get this taken care of and done right now. The other reason why I like bringing this up is because the, the, people are blown away when you show them how the new versions, the modern versions, completely remove verse 37. And if you didn't already know this, please mark this down. Take note of this. Work this into your salvation plan at the end when people get saved. Show them this. Show them one... Hey, now that you believe, you should get baptized because this is very clear. It doesn't matter. The eunuch might have been baptized before, but that should have, he should have been prevented from being baptized. Why? Because he didn't believe with all his heart. So if you got baptized before you put all of your faith in Christ and believed with all of your heart, you got wet. You took a bath. Maybe you got sprinkled. I don't know. I'm pretty sure I got sprinkled as a baby. But that wasn't a legitimate baptism. That's right. Why? Because I didn't believe on Jesus Christ with all my heart. That's why. So it didn't mean anything. It might have meant something to other people, but it didn't mean anything to God. And that's who we care about anyways. If we're going to do something that's right, we're going to do it for the purpose of, of being right with God. But when I show this verse to people, this verse does not exist in the modern, in modern version. So basically what you'll have, if they read their new modern translation, he's going to ask the question, well, why can't I be baptized? And then all of a sudden he's baptizing him. There is no answer in the modern translations. Wow, that's just pretty stupid. Not only that, it goes from verse 36 to verse number 38. Where's verse number 37? There's a little letter next to it. That's what you'll commonly see. And then some footnote, and then they'll say, oh, well, in some manuscripts, it's got, in some manuscripts, you decided not to put it in, yet you still kept the numbering. Huh. The numbering that matches up with the King James Bible. Why would you keep the King James numbering if your translation's better, if it really doesn't belong there? Why, why would you keep that in the numbering? Huh. Maybe because it's removed. Maybe it's because the King James is the standard. Yep. And if someone's looking for Acts chapter 8, verse 40, 
You're not going to find it as easily in the modern translations because you've skipped numbers. Oh, wait, that's actually 39 in this. They can't do that. So that's why every time they remove verses, they still have to keep the numbering in there. Great passage to, to show people. One, why they need to be saved. Two, you know, like that it's not infant baptism. We don't believe in infant baptism. It's, it's people who actually put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It happens right away. It's something that's done immediately. They go right down in the water. He gets baptized. And use the King James Bible. You can cover all of that ground. Very important ground to cover with a new believer. Turn to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, we're going to see an example of people who were already baptized and who were already baptized as an adult. But they didn't believe right. And they get re-baptized. I think it's easier for people, if they've been baptized as an infant, to say, yeah, I know that didn't mean anything. I don't even remember that. I want to get baptized now that I believe. I think it's, but I think it's harder for people who maybe they've been baptized more recently or as an adult. They've gone to some other church and they, and they thought they got saved, but they didn't. They heard some preaching and they thought they got saved. So then they got baptized because they're trying to do what's right. But then it turns out they still didn't really understand the gospel. They didn't really get it. And then they find like, oh, now I understand. Now I believe. Well, now you need to get baptized. And here's the thing. When it comes with baptism, I always just like to err on the side of caution anyways. If anyone ever has any doubt, people, I've been asked so many times about baptisms, pastor, was this a legitimate baptism? Is that a legitimate baptism? You know, I'm kind of wondering about this or I'm not sure about that. I always just say, you know what? You could just get baptized again. If you have any doubt, because here's the thing, if you have any doubt, for one, the Bible says if, if you're do, anything that you do, it's not of faith is sin, first of all. So if you're already thinking that like, Maybe I'm not right with this. The best thing to do is just get it right. You don't have to be proud. You don't have to worry about, oh, I've been coming to church for this long and now I'm getting baptized. Nobody's going to look down on you or think any less of you if that's the case. And they shouldn't. I mean, if they do, they, should, they definitely shouldn't. That's not right of them. I think people will just be happy to see somebody getting baptized. Now, Maybe in God's eyes, some baptism that you had previously was fine with him, and he's good with that. It doesn't hurt to just do it again. I mean, it's not that God's not going to be upset. Oh, you got baptized again. I can't believe you did that. It doesn't matter. But here's the thing. If there was a problem with your previous baptism, then why not? And I'll be honest with you. There are some circumstances and some situations that I don't really know the answer to. I have a tendency to think that it's, it's probably okay. So like, here's an example I've been given before. Someone says, well, hey, I got saved. And I know when I got saved and I believed. But I didn't know a lot about other religions and other teachings, other things. And they got baptized in some other church. Right? Some Pentecostal church. Or, you know, some church where they just do not preach the right, the right gospel. We don't have a lot of teaching on situations like that in Scripture. Not that I'm able to, to understand, at least. Now, what I believe is that if that happened, your baptism's probably fine because, you, because of what matters is you got saved and then you got baptized. But I could understand people being concerned and say, well, that guy wasn't even saved, so who, why, why should he be the one baptizing me? They say, well, if you're worried about that, then just get baptized by someone else. But here's the thing. You can't always go back. What if someone turns out way later to be some false prophet? You know, like, I don't think God's requiring people then to, well, now everybody got baptized by that person all needs to be re-baptized again. You know, I, I don't believe that. I don't, I don't think that that's the way that God did it because 
if he wanted it to be that strict on the rules, then, he, then it would be there. We get some liberty in, in different areas of, of, our, of our walk with God and, and what God expects of us. And I think that that's one of those areas because it's just not very clear. I think, okay, as long as you in your heart are, you've got your faith in Christ and then you decide to do the right thing and get baptized, I'm pretty sure, that I, I, I'm pretty sure that that's what God's looking at. But hey, you know, you disagree with me and that's fine. And if you're worried about it, just get baptized again. So it's, it's, real, it's a real simple answer. Like, you can't, you can't ask for anything easier than that. Don't even fret about it. Don't even think about it anymore. Just do it. Who cares? If I, if I thought that that was any type of problem, I would just do it. Acts chapter 19, look at verse number one. The Bible says, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? Hey, you're believers. Have you received the Holy Ghost? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. They're like, We don't even know what you're talking about, Holy Ghost. What are you talking about? What's the Holy Ghost? <laughs> he says, uh, Unto what then were you baptized? <laughs> How were you even baptized then? And again, and this is going to go into then how we baptize people here in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost. He said, how could you have not even heard of the Holy Ghost? What were you baptized unto? And they said unto John's baptism. So John was out baptizing people. Of course, he's baptizing a lot of people out in the wilderness. And, and again, this just goes to show when people are out doing a work, he's preaching the gospel, there's going to be some people that, that are going to end up being baptized in a ministry because they're going to say the right thing, but they don't necessarily understand it. And you can repeat the right answers, but they don't necessarily get it. They didn't fully understand the gospel. And I think that's exactly the case here. These people didn't fully understand the gospel. They didn't quite get it. I mean, they were really close. I think they understood a lot, but they just didn't quite get it. And they ended up getting baptized. They're like, well, we just got, you know, we were baptized under John's baptism. So what's going on out there? We liked it. We were part of that. We got, we don't even know what you're talking about, Holy Ghost, though. Then said Paul, John verily, verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. And, and here's a, another great passage where it gives us what, the, what John the Baptist was preaching, what he was saying when he was preaching, repent, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, because all the repent of your sins, people say, see, John the Baptist preached repentance and Jesus preached repentance. But see, they're, they're applying a false definition to the word repent. That's right. We believe they pre preach repentance also. Yeah, right. Amen. I preach repentance. Right. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Guess what? That's repentance. Amen. When you weren't believing on him before and you decide to believe on him now, you've repented. You know what? That lines up with what John the Baptist preached about repentance. Sure. Because Acts 19, verse number 4 says, Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. Amen. Baptizing with the baptism of repentance. And what did he say? Believe on him that should come after me, Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. It looks like they must have looked, because he said, unto John's baptism. They were looking to John as their, as their, as their guide, as their, hey, I'm a, I'm a follower of John. I'm a disciple of John the Baptist, or whatever. But didn't understand, apparently, that it was all about Christ. So they got, and that, that wasn't very long amount of time from when they were, you know, I mean, years few years maybe they're in you know, who knows John's ministry until before he died obviously before he's beheaded before he's cast into prison they had gotten baptized under that under his ministry and then later on they run across Apostle Paul he said no 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 explain it to him more clearly they get baptized again so what got a good example of that in scripture Getting baptized again as an adult. No, I, I didn't, didn't quite get it before. Now I get it. You're saved. Now I get baptized. Uh, turn to Matthew chapter 28. 
Matthew chapter 28. The Great Commission, this great statement that Jesus Christ made, gave unto his disciples before uh, ascending to heaven here, you know, finally he's giving them instruction, the very end of the New Testament, or the end of the book of Matthew, and the end of the book of Mark, and this is what he gives them and tells them to do. Verse number 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. As I mentioned before, this is, this is how we do baptisms here. We're baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. The triune God. That's the God we believe in. That's the God we worship. That's the God that we baptize people in the name of. Um, he gave the example. Even if you see, you know, and I'm not going to get into the whole baptizing in the name of Jesus and everything else. Um, but we have a clear command from Jesus Christ right here saying to do that. We also have in Acts 19. So what did you, you know, how, do you, how could you not have even heard of the Holy Ghost? Turn to Matthew chapter 3. This is going more into how we baptize, just like we baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. We also do a baptism, the war, and, and the way that we do it is a person goes completely underwater. We don't pour a pitcher of water over their head. We don't take a cup and do that. Some, some people do that. Some churches out there believe that, and they'll, they'll take a pitcher, and they'll pour water, and they'll say that's a baptism. Others will, will you know, sprinkle water and just call that a baptism. But it's really just ignorance, because that word baptism is a transliteration into English of the Greek word. Now, I'm not, you know, this big fan of going back to the Greek, but the word in English means to be immersed, which is the same thing that the Greek word means. And it came from, the reason why I mean bring up Greek is because that's where the word literally just came from. It's a word that was used in scripture. It wasn't just some common word that was, that was common in language. It was something that was created and used for this purpose. And the English language didn't have a word for this. So they just took, well, hey, this is what people were calling it in Greek. Bautismo, ba baptism. Just, just change it, Engli you know, anglicize it. That's what they did. And it became, and that's what baptism is. So the, the definition, the word literally means to be immersed, enveloped, just surrounded by, engulfed with. Okay? And you can get and understand that meaning without me telling you that when you read through Scripture, when it talks about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So what happens? They are endued with power. I mean, the Holy Ghost is just surrounding and enveloping, just completely on a person. On and through the Holy Ghost is just completely immersed a person. And then they're doing these great works. And you, and you can see in Scripture also that they're going into the water. Every time someone's getting baptized, see, here's water, why does anybody baptize? And then they two went down into the water. If you just need the pour, why, does it, why do you need to go get your feet wet and go stand in the river, you know, or stand in the lake? Why do we need to go through all that trouble if you could just, you know, scoop up some water and put it over my head? I don't want to get my shoes wet. I don't want to get my socks wet. I don't want to deal with that. Because baptism is getting completely dunked underwater. It's going down under. Matthew 3, verse number 13. This is Jesus' bat baptism. The Bible says, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. Verse 14. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, baptized, excuse me, went up straightway out of the water. So if he comes up out of the water, it means he was in the water. All right, makes sense. And lo, the heavens were open unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. Uh, that's just one example. I already brought up the Acts chapter 8 example. John 3, 23, you have to turn to, turn to Romans chapter 6, the last place I'll 
have you turn, or maybe one more place after that. John 3, 23, it says, And John also was baptizing in Enon near to Salem because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. So the reason why John picked a specific location to baptize is because there was much water there. You don't need much water to pour some water over someone's head. You don't need much water, especially to sprinkle. I don't have much water in this cup. If, if I thought a sprinkling was baptism, I could get a lot of baptisms out of this one cup by going, all right, you're baptized. All right, that's going to that's gonna get me pretty far. I could probably baptize a thousand people with the drops that are found in that little bottom of my cup there. No, because that's, that's not baptism. That's not biblical baptism. There needs to be much water. That's so why we got that, that tub of water over there that's ready to baptize people by immersing them in the water. So what does it all mean? We're going to read in Romans 6 what it means. But before we even read Romans 6, this is the examples. I, I like to give some analogies and examples of people about baptism because we know it doesn't save a person. But what it does do is it shows people that, that you do believe in your heart. It's an outward expression of your faith. Because in, in order to get baptized, you need to believe. What you're doing by getting baptized is you're showing what's in your heart. Philip couldn't see what was in the eunuch's heart when he asked, well, why can't I be baptized? Well, <laughs> you need to believe. So he said it with his words, which he could understand, okay, if this is in his heart, and then he's showing that that faith is in his heart by getting baptized. Baptism itself, and we're going to get this from Romans 6, so I just want to explain it real quick. And this is a, a great way to summarize it to someone who doesn't understand, well, why do I need to get baptized? A couple things. One, baptism I like showing as wearing a wedding ring. When I got this wedding band put on, did I put this wedding band on before I got married? No, just to see if it fit maybe, but... <laughs> No, I wasn't going, walking around wearing a wedding band before I got married. What happens first? The marriage happens first, and then the ring gets put on the finger, right? Now, if I take this off, put it away, am I no longer married now because I took that wedding ring off? No, I'm just as married as I was a second ago, right? Whether or not I have this on, I wear it, or even own it, doesn't change the fact that I'm married. Right. Yeah. Marriage is still legitimate, still there. Why do I wear this? Is it to remind myself that I'm married? No. I don't need to remind myself. I live with my wife. I know I'm married. I've been married for a long time. <laughs> of course, I don't need to, oh man, I'm married. What am I doing? No. The purpose of having a wedding ring is to show other people that you're married. All the women that are lining up for Pastor Burzin, sorry. You know. <laughs> Just kidding. But seriously, it's, it is to show other people that you're married. Right? It's to show, uh, you know, this woman or this man is taken, you're married. You know, it's an outward symbol of something that has no physical manifestation. The marriage. It's a vow. It's a commitment. This is the outward manifestation of that. The baptism is the outward manifestation of what's in your heart, of your belief, of your faith, of your trust, of your salvation. That new creature that's inside that nobody can see. You get baptized publicly, you show that to people outwardly. Hey, I believe this. So I'm gonna, this is, I'm gonna do this physical thing, demonstrating it. And the actual act of baptism is symbolic of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So as a person stands up in the water, it's representative of Jesus Christ being hung on the cross. When a person is dunked under the water, bring them down, that's the picture of the burial, right? the death and burial of Christ. 
And then the coming back up out of the water symbolizes the resurrection of Jesus Christ up out of the grave. That's what our trust is in. That's what our faith is in. That's where our heart is. That's why we get baptized. We're showing that openly to everybody. Romans chapter 6, verse number 1. The Bible says, actually, let's flip back. I'm going to turn there too. Let's read the end of Romans chapter 5. Because Romans chapter 6 just is a continuation, of course, of what was said in Romans chapter 5. Uh, how far back do I want to read? Let's start reading verse number 18. It says, therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So what this is saying is this, no matter how much sin there is, no matter how many sins there are, grace abounds and covers all of the sins. So someone keeps sinning, if you keep sinning, if anyone keeps sinning, people keep sinning today, grace abounds and covers all of the sin. There is, there is no end that's limitless, the, the boundless where, where the, the covering for sin and grace always abounds over sin. But then in chapter 6, he's going to continue on the same thought because this is where a lot of people have a problem with easy believism, right? right. Well, you, so you're telling me that I could just be saved because I believe, but then I could just go out and live however I want and I'm still saved? Yes. Right. Yes, that's what I'm telling you. Now, oftentimes people say, and it doesn't even matter. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying it doesn't matter. I'm not saying if you just go off and sin, it doesn't matter. That is not what I'm saying at all. Right. I am saying that if you go off and sin, you are still saved, yes. Because where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. But then Romans chapter 6 ties it together to give us the other side of that to say, okay, now <laughs> we've got this straightened out where sin abounds, grace abounds even more, right? We're good on that. What shall we say then? Verse number one, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, hey, why not? Let's just keep on sinning then because who doesn't like grace? Let's just have more and more. Let's pile on the grace, right? <laughs> so let's just keep on sinning so we can pile on grace. God forbid. Verse number two, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should Walk in newness of life. The same way that Jesus Christ, hey, we're buried with Christ in baptism. The Bible says that, that's, that's the picture. That's a demonstration. When you get baptized, you're demonstrating that Jesus Christ died and paid for your sins when he died on that cross and was buried. That's a representation of your sins. You're the one getting baptized. You're showing my sins are buried with Christ. I'm leaving my sins there. Yep. And as Christ resurrected, the first begotten of the dead, in a sense, that's a new life. Yep. In a sense. I'm saying it's some new created being. It's a, in a sense, it's a new life. It's a resurrected life. That's how we ought to walk in newness of life. Leave those sins. Christ paid for those. They're dead. They're buried. Let's leave those in the grave. Let's leave those sins behind. And when you get baptized, 
that's also illustrating what you should be doing and what you should be thinking in your heart. Hey, I'm done with that. Amen. I'm going to walk in newness of life. I'm going to serve the Lord now. I'm going to take that first step of obedience and get baptized. And now I'm going to live for God. I am thankful. I'm glad that Jesus Christ paid for my sins. I'm going to show everybody here. I'm leaving it there and I'm moving forward. Let's keep reading here. Verse number four, therefore we are buried with him by baptism and death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is a reminder. This is something that we should always be reminding ourselves with. That we need to reckon ourselves dead to sin but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So should we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. No, we're dead to sin. We're going to leave that sin in the grave, but we're going to keep moving forward. We're going to walk in newness of life. That is another application, another, you know, just what baptism is all about. What does it mean? And I've heard, I know of many stories and, and, and my own personal testimony is an, another example of this. I've seen it. I can't fully explain it other than just what's written in Scripture here. But so many times I've seen people who've already been saved, but once they decide to get baptized, once they finally do it, they hear about it, whatever. I, I, so many times I've seen people get fired up and just motivated to serve God from that moment forward. Doesn't matter how long they've been saved previously, but as soon as they get baptized, it's just like, man, I want to live for God. I know that happened for me. I've been out of church since I've gotten saved practically very seldomly went to church at all. As soon as I got baptized, boom, started getting more consistent, more regular. I treated it more seriously. It meant a lot more to me. And I finally was able to start living in a way where I'm dying to the, you know, put it mortifying the deeds of my flesh, putting that away, letting that be dead and, and continuing to walk more in newness of life. That's how my life turned out. And I know many other people have the same exact testimony as me. There's something to it. There's something to the baptism that's there that um, it's hard for me to express in words, but it's there. Turn to Acts chapter 10. It's the last place we'll look at. Acts chapter 10, I'm only going to show you one verse on this. There's others, but just to get the point across. Even though baptism doesn't save, we don't have to be baptized in order to be saved or anything like that, it is a commandment. It's something that we are commanded to do. If you're going to be in obedience to God, if you're going to, if you're going to um, you know, walk in newness of life, we need to get baptized. So everyone who gets saved should get baptized, should walk in newness of life. It's something that God wants us to do. And even you know, the disciples commanded people to be baptized. Acts chapter 10, the last verse, verse number 48 Actually, we read verse number 47. Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. He commanded them. Hey, no one can forbid these people to be baptized. Baptize those people. They need to be baptized. It is a... Uh, a big deal. We, if we want people to become disciples and become soul winners and to really grow in their spiritual life, let's start with baptism. Yeah. New converts, you talk to them at the door, bring up baptism. And they don't need to understand all the ins and outs. They don't need to hear a full sermon on it of all the reasons why. Now, now they can, but they don't need to have that you could show them a few
few places. Show them Acts chapter 8. Show them a couple, you know, just show them, hey, this is, this is important. This is what people did in the Bible. God wants you to be baptized now that you're saved. He wants you to, to be dead indeed unto sin and walk in newness of life. Let's get you baptized. Just do it. And, and we can accommodate basically any time. So for this month, our goal is three. I'm hoping I'm shooting short, but it's just I, sometimes it's really hard. I understand it's hard to get people excited about living for God after they get saved. So many people don't return to, to, to give God thanks at all. Like the lepers that were cleansed. But I, if we're not even bringing it up, and shame on us, it's, it, then it's almost dead sure not going to happen. People today aren't, aren't having the same attitude. They're not seeing all these people getting baptized and going, oh, what's that? I want to be a part of that. Yeah. Baptism now has become a lot more normalized to where a lot of people don't even think much of it. Or they've been baptized in the past. They just don't, you know, oh, yeah, I've already done that. I've already, I've already been baptized. <coughs> so let's, uh, let's focus on that as a church. Let's, let's try to add that, incorporate that in the way that we go soul winning to try to help people walk in newness of life after they get saved. As far as I have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for uh, our salvation, for the free gift, and for all of the clear instruction that you give us from your words. Lord, I pray that you please help us to be better soul winners, help us to be um, better teachers and instructors of your word. Help us to teach all nations everything that you've commanded us, Lord. Help us to, um, to just really try and put forth an effort as much as we can, that as much as we care about people being saved and going to heaven, let's continue to care for them, to help them to, uh, to get into church, to get baptized, and, and to start living a, a righteous, holy, sanctified life, dear Lord. And um, we, we need your help to do that. And um, help us to change habits if we're not used to doing that. Help us to overcome those things and to, and to be uh, stirred up in our hearts and our minds to be, be cognizant and thinking about these things. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.